Wow, that's a reception. That's amazing. How's everybody doing? Come the on. The media told me nobody was here. Look at all these people. <laughs> <laughs> Bacon, this is your inaugural CPAC appearance. Yes, I was never allowed to do this kind of thing when I was at Fox, and now I'm free. You're free. You're free. And let's talk a little bit about this. So there's this rise of alternative media. I don't even want to call it alternative media, but it is this media that's trying to present the truth. It's trying to present a more comprehensive picture. How have you seen media change in, in your career? Oh, my God, hugely. I mean... When I was a lawyer back in the dark ages, I remember seeing clips of this woman, Jessica Savage. And if you're old enough, you remember who that is. And if you're young, you've never heard of her. But she was on NBC, and she was beautiful, and she, was, she rose at the same time as Connie Chung, yep. and made it in, at a time when very few women were even in news. And that was the era of like straight facts, no personality, just the facts. And that was a golden era in some ways. It wasn't completely infected with left-wing bias. It was there, but it wasn't as bad. And then you flash forward to during the Trump era when they openly declared their bias. They leaned into it. They thought it was important to say their own opinion. He's a bigot. He's a racist. He's a this. He's a that. And completely sacrificed their objectivity and in so doing, sacrificed the industry. I mean, it was, I've said before, it was an assisted suicide. Uh, Trump helped them, uh, but they did it to themselves. Yeah, but we just saw, for example, when President Trump won the Iowa caucus, and you saw Rachel Maddow come out on MSNBC saying, no, no, we're not going to put out the whole speech. Yes. No, no, because, they want, they, because she wanted her voice to be heard and not allow the viewers, now we know the viewers there are, you know, lean left, to listen to what Donald Trump had to say. I mean, this is pure propaganda. So this is her problem. She never had children, and she decided her audience must be her children. <laughs> they need to be babied like little toddlers because their mommy can't allow them to hear any of the naughty words that Trump is going to speak because, she explained, they traffic in truth at MSNBC, which is the biggest lie we've heard on, out of anybody over there. Yes. I mean, after all the years of Russiagate, for her to actually look at the audience and say, we don't traffic in lies and we can't allow an, a non-true thing to be said to you, and I'll be the policewoman of it, please. I mean, people know it's a You're lie. You're right about that. It's that the media is this, this leftist media, this propaganda machine. They literally line up the Democrat talking points, and it is so much of this Trump hatred like I've never ever, ever seen. And quite frankly, they hate the Trump activists. They hate the MAGA voter. They, oh, they, yeah. they, are, they are insulted by the MAGA voter. What is that disconnect? Is it just New York and like the New York media, that kind of elite media that is not no, it's not just where the rest of America is? It's not just them. I yeah. mean, it's really all media other than alternative. But this is I think what CNN is struggling with right now, at least MSNBC has kind of owned how much it hates Republicans right. for a long time. They're not faking it. I mean, yeah. I give them points. I mean, they're fake news, but they're not faking it. Right. Okay, it's exactly, it. there's a dis <laughs> distinction there. Right. Uh, but CNN, you know, back when I was on the primetime of Fox News, I used to watch CNN as I was getting ready for the Kelly file. They were kind of boring, but they were straight down the middle. And like, you know, you get the basic facts. Then during Trump, they completely broke. I mean. Trump broke CNN. He ruined CNN. They ruined themselves, but he, you know, he gave them the invitation and they took it. Right. And now they want us to see them as possible to trust. You know, now we're supposed to look at the same anchors who said, not only do I disagree with you, I hate you. Yeah. I can't stand you. Your children, everything that is important to you, I loathe. And you're supposed to say, you can be fair. <laughs> I, I, sure, I trust her. It's, it's, of course, a broken model, and right. I do think that's why, one of the reasons why alternative media is doing so well. Well, the Trump derangement syndrome grows even further when we're talking about lawfare. This is something that, uh, you know, we see the propaganda machine, something you would see in an authoritarian regime. Then you're moving towards this sense of lawfare, which is really, I think, a scary uh, tactic that's being used by the left. But then it gets interesting. I felt like I was watching a soap opera when I was watching uh, Bonnie Willis and her love interest, Nathan Wade, yes. right? Yes. I mean, that was one of the craziest uh, court, uh, TV court, I mean, yes. you know, that you can imagine. It was like a soap opera. It I, was like a soap opera. I love what's happening in that case. I'm not going to lie. I, I, <laughs> Tell us more. So, <laughs> I was not going to do a show today 
because I was coming here to be with all of you. So I took the train down. Yeah. And um, I took the train down. And we, but then, I don't know if you saw today's news on Fannie Willis. Oh, please tell us. Just It's tell amazing. Us. Um, and so we did a show. I just did a show from the hotel room before I came down here. And it'll be out later, the Megyn Kelly show. Download for free. Um, <laughs> in any event, it's insane. So these two prosecutors, Fannie Wade and the man she brought in, Nathan Wade, admit that they had an affair. They denied it Fannie started. Fannie Willis, you already changed her name. I go with Fanny. I think we all know it's Fanny. <laughs> okay. Um, Fanny Willis. I keep saying Fanny Wade. I thought you said Fanny. You said Fanny Wade. She's Fanny Willis, but I keep saying Fanny Wade. I mean, I'm hoping something could come, something Fanny. good could come out of this for them. <laughs> um, so she, they both took the stand in this trial. They denied that they had an affair any time prior to her hiring them. And now, bit by bit, we're learning, of course, it appears very much the opposite. And what happened today was the Trump team got, they subpoenaed the cell phone records of Nathan Wade during 2021. And according to the private investigator, who's got expertise in analyzing cell phone right. tower data and cell phone data, he called her, they, they spoke on the phone in 11 months, um, 2,000 times, 1,800 texts. I averaged it out, it was about 180 text, texts a day. Um, I went back and looked at mine with my husband. We were at one-fifth of the ratio that those two were. <laughs> he was allegedly over there, according to the cell phone analysis, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. and then midnight and 5 a.m. And according to CBS News, she's going to get ready to defend this today by saying, he was part of my, like, kitchen cabinet team. Oh, yeah. For discussing random cases. Because, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you know, when you have business to discuss, sure. yeah. who doesn't have their platonic colleague over at 4 a.m.? We were saying it wasn't a booty call, it was a fanny call. <laughs> <laughs> Too much? No, not at all. Keep going. Uh, so, but anyway, can I just put a, oh, a please, pin on that? Please, no. So I do believe they're both going to get booted off of this case. Really? I believe they lied under oath to this judge to save their own skins. They're prosecuting Trump and his colleagues for lying. That is one of the main yeah. things that she's accusing them of. And the reason it's so delicious is because the same thing I believe that made Fannie Willis lie under oath, despite the fact that it would be wrong for a civilian, but it's really wrong for an officer of the court, is the same thing that made her bring this BS prosecution. Yeah. It's her partisan, dishonest nature. She wanted to get Trump, just like Letitia James wanted to get Trump, and Alvin Bragg, and Jack Smith, and I really think that the, the brilliant lawfare artists on the defense side in Georgia should have a talk with the other defense lawyers in these other cases. Because if this is how we're going to fight, dirty, below the belt, making up charges, breaking our system of rule of law, which didn't use to prosecute political enemies, then we should fight back the same way. Right. It should be brought right, right back on right. all these prosecutors. Right. Going into what we've seen with all of these cases. I mean, you've got the Stormy Daniels case against Trump as well. That's going to be heard here shortly. You've got Jack Smith's obsession, obsession with Donald Trump. Yep. You've got, obviously, the civil uh, fraud case in New York, Judge Enderon, who $340 million. It's going to be $450 million. 400 by the time we're done with this? Yeah. I mean, how would... Well, so I, they're just I trying mean, to break this man. They're trying to destroy trying to his him. life, destroy his family. All for political persecution. We've really crossed the Rubicon. Yeah. We just, we never used to do this to each other. Like, we would fight. We knew we disagreed. We'd fight, you know, bare-knuckled brawling, the, the two sides. But we would never put a man's freedom at risk just because we disagreed with him. Right. We would never try to devastate his business and disincentivize any good man or woman for running for, for office. Right? Like, who, who would run? Don't you know, like, a couple of great people in your life who you're like, God, you'd be great to run, you know? Who, who that's sane would run no. if you thought this was a likely outcome? You know, I asked Trump about it. I interviewed him in September, and I was like, what are you, what are you doing this for? You already were president. You could, you could be in Scotland doing the golf, which you love, and enjoying your grandkids, and he isn't built that way. And I do think he thinks he's got unfinished business for the country. You know, and I think the country feels the same. So, what legal advice would you give Donald Trump? Honestly, keep at it. Because I'll tell you, Trump's got four criminal trials coming his way. 
And in order to avoid, I heard Rob and JD talking about, is he likely to you know, go to jail? And I do think JD's right, they'll, Senator Vance, uh, they'll try, they'll try to make him go to jail. But Trump needs to pull an inside straight in order to avoid jail. And can I tell you something? He's doing it. He's doing it. I've been watching these cases very carefully. It's not a lock, but it's going as well as it can go. He's obviously got very good lawyers around him. The New York case is BS. He's not facing real jail time in that one. That should be a slap on the wrist. And he is going to be convicted, but it's such BS. He allegedly paid a porn star to be quiet, and then they're mad he didn't document his hush payment. That's <laughs> the very nature of a hush payment, is that you don't write it down and tell everybody about it. <laughs> anyway, so that's that one. Then you got the two Jack Smith litigations, right. where it's all you know January 6th and the Mar-a-Lago documents. Well, the Mar-a-Lago -Mar documents is getting slow rolled and slow rolled and slow rolled because it's so complex. Does the jury need security clearance? Did the, the lawyers need security clearance to see the documents he had? This is not getting tried yeah, before no. November. Mm -hmm. And if Trump can win, both of those federal prosecutions go away. He doesn't need to pardon himself. He just needs to pull the DOJ off of the cases. That's it. All he needs to do is delay those two cases until post-November. And it's happening. Yeah. Now, the, the one in DC, she really wants to try this case. Judge Chutkin. Okay. Would yes. love to put Trump oh, behind yes. bars. And that one is he's vulnerable in because of the jury pool and because but that one too has got the main heart of it, of the obstruction charge. And I'm trying not to bore you, but there's the main charge is the obstruction charge. You obstructed a proceeding of Congress on January 6th. That's going up to the Supreme Court no. through the other January 6th defendants, and their case is very strong. Right. So the heart of that Trump case could get thrown out through a proceeding that's going up with other defendants. And that leaves us with Georgia and my girl, Fanny. Girl, Fanny. <laughs> Go, Fanny. And if wow. Fanny Willis is thrown off this case, yeah. her entire office is thrown off this yes. case. And there are real questions about whether there is another prosecutor down in Georgia who would take it and wants to try it. Yeah. Fanny Cash. Fanny Cash. Yeah. That should be her name. <laughs> um, shifting gears here, obviously, you're a mom. You know, and, and you're, you have two boys, one girl. We were having this discussion uh, as a mother of five girls. And parents out there, they're, they're freaking out. They're looking at the fact that this leftist agenda has penetrated into their schools. This is a topic we've been discussing here, uh, where you have 14-year-old girls having mastectomies. They're getting puberty blockers. You have the medical industry su supporting this. How do we stop this? If you take nothing else away, I hope, from anything I say tonight, please take this away. Fight. You have to. You can't remain silent to protect your reputation or how people feel about you. Parents need to stand up against this. Your child's safety, and apart from their safety, their opportunity, their, the chance at winning, the chance of having the glory of crossing the finish line first, it's all in danger if you don't say anything. And I know it's scary, you're afraid, you want to be seen as empathetic and not a bigot, not a transphobe. Eventually, hopefully, you'll get to the point where many of us are, which is, I don't care what you call me. Exactly. I couldn't care less what you think of me when I'm standing up for children's rights. A couple of things here. Number one, they tell us that the puberty blockers into the cross-sex hormones, it's fine. Puberty blockers are just a pause. It's a lie. 97% of kids who go on puberty blockers will do cross-sex hormones immediately thereafter. And you know what that does? That will sterilize your child. Your, now your child is more than likely going to be sterile and zero sexual enjoyment for the rest of his or her life. That, did you know that? There will be no sexual pleasure for your child. You want to make that decision for a 13-year-old? You think they know what they're giving up? There was a detransitioner recently who managed to get pregnant, which is against all the odds. And she was in tears at the birth of her baby, not fully tears of joy, but also because she couldn't breastfeed. She had had her breast chopped off when she was a, a teenager, a young teenager. Yeah. And you know, Mercedes, it's like when I had my child, my first child, I, of course, went through the nine months of pregnancy. The moment I felt like I really became a mother was when they put that baby to your breast and you're like, holy mother, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It's this before and after moment. Men, don't men, what is it, chest feed? Is I can't. 
And the, there's no and such the, thing as and chest the male pregnant, pregnancy. That's that's the one I'm like, really, people. Chest really? feeding is child abuse. They pump these men through full of hormones, and then so they can produce something approximating milk. And then this poor tortured baby is in agony trying to get enough out of there. It's a lie. But it's a lie, Megan. But this is the thing. The left has hijacked our language. They have changed what is what would be common sense, just language. We have to now do pronouns. Every time I see these young people out there where they on Instagram and they're like, she, her, they, it's like, no. Seriously. No. Ser no. Pronouns are for English class. Don't not do that. For, for, but it, it's like, it, how can these parents get to their kids and their grandkids and sh sh basically say, please stop this. You You're have, being brainwashed. You have to inoculate them at home. You know, I mean, you have to get them, they're going to be in a leftist world. It's a leftist media, leftist sports, leftist corporate America, uh, not to mention the academy, you know, the universities and so on. You have to inoculate them at home by talking about it. Right. I, my, we've told our kids, don't say your pronouns. You, if somebody asks you what your pronouns are, you just say, I'm not comfortable with that. You don't have to do it. Just because some leftist tries to make you, you don't have to do that. Right. And let me tell you something. There was a great piece online, and I love the line, the title of it. Pronouns are rohypnol. They dull your senses. It's the, the way the left controls language is to make you behave the way they want you right. to behave. You know, like, this is racist, this is transphobic, this is so that you won't do the thing, you won't say the thing. And saying the pronouns is how they get you to bend on gender ideology. They dull your brain to the incongruity of calling a he a she. And they're doing it intentionally. They want you to get dulled to that fake reality they're shoving down our throats. Right. You have to resist. I, you can say with all due respect, I, I don't do that. And look, if I'm sitting across, and I've actually had this conversation with Caitlyn Jenner, but if I were sitting across from Caitlyn Jenner, would I intentionally be like, he, he, he? No, I'm not looking to be a jerk. But I, I would not say, you know, what's it like to be a woman? How about being, you know, being a girl, being a, no, that's a lie. And I do think we need to reject pronouns and the lies of language because yeah. otherwise we're, we're pulled in. Yeah. part of the problem. And then on the, on the biological men playing in women's sports, which again, I cannot believe that we are talking about this now. Like, I just cannot believe that we have to face this where our girls have to be put in a situation where they can actually get hurt. And they are they, getting hurt. Yeah, and they are getting hurt. There was Peyton McNabb in North Carolina who still has permanent injuries, uh, including mental issues, brain issues, and uh, paralysis down her arm after a male volleyball player posing as a girl spiked the ball so hard in her head that she suffered permanent damage. There was a, f a girl playing field hockey in Massachusetts just a couple of months ago who got her, all of her teeth knocked out. As a boy, pretending to be a girl, slammed that field hockey ball hard into her face. There were three girls in Massachusetts this, this week, in Lowell, Massachusetts, who were hurt playing basketball against a six-foot-tall boy pretending to be a girl. That's the way you should say it. There's no such thing as trans anything. It's boy pretending to be a girl yeah. who hurt three girls to the point where they had to end the game early and the coach pulled the team. Someone's going to die. Someone's going to die. Find your voice. Fight. It's not fair and it's not safe. No. And I think... I will say, in this room, we've got the fighters. These are, our, these are the people who go back to their community, and they make a difference. They are so incredible in terms of getting involved in their communities. And so many organic groups have come out of CPAC, and they are the ones involved in so much of the election process as well, which is incredible. God bless you. I, I want to move to the college campuses. We, we know uh, we had a panel up here, uh, would Moses go to Harvard, which I loved. Of course, Slap comes up with these great panel names. <laughs> Uh, it made it on Jimmy Kimmel, which was kind of funny. Um, so, kind of. Um, so let me uh, let me ask you this. There is uh, again, you stay shocked because you're wondering how can so many young people not understand the role of Israel and not understand the Hamas terrorism propaganda message that's being pushed through TikTok, through social media, to these young people, and, and then you've created this animosity on campus for Jewish students. Yeah. Well, I think there are two things going on there. Number one, back to the inoculation point, I don't think anybody could do this to my kids. They, no one's going to do this to your kids, Mercy. They, they know. No, we disown them, quite frankly. 
No, I'm. Well, we've gotten in early with our children. We've <laughs> shared our values and we've talked to our kids about yes. what is yes. going to be done to them on college campuses. And we, in our family, do not allow our children to use social media. Um, which parents misunderstand. You can give them a phone. Yeah. You can give them a phone and they can message. Yes. And they can. Uh, we actually do some YouTube, which I know is technically social media, but like. My daughter watches Dance Moms on it. It's not, you know. Oh, don't talk about Dance Moms. But I, the TikTok, rumble, Snapchat. Rumble, like rumble. Yeah, that's right. But I'm talking about like TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, yeah. Facebook. Like these are not appropriate tools for children. And in particular, TikTok is where this be begins. So I do think keeping them away from social media in the young formative years and you reinforcing your own values and what's true is important and keeping the right news sources funneling to them so they're hearing facts that you know are real. Not left. It's not like don't leave Al Jazeera on the TV while you go off for your run. <laughs> um, but I, I, I also think that um, like when they get to the university, they're going to need to find their spines mm -hmm. and their friends. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why I love Turning Point. Like we have to get to young people yeah. and make sure they know they're not alone. You may feel like you're the only conservative voice on campus, but you're not. The TikTok in particular is a problem because that is really funneling pro Hamas information and pro Bin Laden. And pro, yes. You saw the, like, and literally these morons yeah. were like, you, you know that Bin Laden? Really, you have to hand it to that Bin Laden. He has a point. No, you do not have to hand it to Bin Laden. That's right. You've got to actually do some study and some homework. So the only, the only plus of the anti-Semitism that we've been seeing on college campuses, the only upside to all of this in the wake of the horrific October 7th attack, is that our Jewish friends who were more left-leaning and believed the DEI lie, I think are now seeing the truth, mm. which is that it's pernicious and it's actually really dangerous. And so, like, it's not okay to, whether it's black and white or Hispanic and Jews, whatever, like, it's not okay to divide us by race or ethnicity. Like, we're all the same. It's why I don't like the black national anthem. There's only one national anthem. We yes. don't need it by color or by creed, right? So, in any event, I, I think all that's important messaging, but you, the number one thing is to shore up your child before he gets there. No, that, that, is, tr that is true, although I've met a lot of parents that say, I, my kid was conservative, they go to college, and then I lose them. And that, that's a challenge for these parents, right? It's like, you, it's heartbreaking. And then you're just, well, literally, I feel like we have to constantly be, I say pray every day for your kid, pray every day. Because they have to understand, when you, being here, you know you're gonna get persecuted. You know you're gonna suffer. And, it's, and you went through it. Yep. I mean, they tried to destroy you. Yep. But you rose up again. Well, there's a lovely feeling to that. I'd rather people try to destroy me and me keep going than people never try to destroy me at all. You know, you, you don't know how strong you are until somebody keeps knocking you down and you keep getting back up. And I really, like, I think it's true for my kids and I think it's true for me. You know, mine are little. They're. 14, 12, and 10. But in the same way, like, I really kind of hope, I know it sounds weird, but I, I hope they all get their hearts broken. Mm -hmm. I hope they get rejected. I hope they have a big failure. I hope they strike out. I hope all those things happen to them because I want them to be strong. They're going to have to be. And you don't get strong if nobody ever challenges you or hurts you or comes at you. And I think for all of you guys, if you know, you're active and you're activists and you're out there fighting these good fights, like, it's a blessing, it's an important role, but you also have to be tough. And you, just like I, have to realize that there's a difference between the you, you, and the branded you, right? Like, Megyn Kelly is, it's a brand because it's on a show name and people know it from news, but Megyn Kelly, the person, is also there. And when I see the attacks and people write the terrible things, I never take that as an attack on Megyn Kelly, the person. That's Megyn Kelly, the brand, that they're attacking. You know, the public-facing Megyn Kelly. And that's fine. For me, that works to make that distinction. Um, and I, it's, it makes it very easy for me not to hold a grudge and to continue fighting and to keep, continue seeing these people and not to become bitter. Yes. Right? To be a happy warrior. So you have the same thing. You, you're going to put your public face out there, and you're going to say these things that are controversial and nobody else is saying them. And they're going to call you the names and maybe ostracize you. Maybe you don't get invited to the best cocktail parties. Those aren't, aren't the best. And you make the distinction in your own life between the, the professional you that's got to make these points to keep your kids safe, et cetera, and the real you who they don't know and they couldn't possibly be criticizing. Mm. Mm. What message? <laughs>
What message of hope do you want to give this group? Look, we're in, I would say, one of the toughest times of our country. We feel not, we're not, we don't feel safe. We feel there is so much chaos all around us. And, and people are worried. They're worried. I understand that entirely. I think, look, I think you guys should feel great because the country is divided, but I actually happen to think it's not as bad as many think. Look at the left. The left is coming over on immigration, right? They're coming over on some of the Trump a little economic slow. programs. They're a little, a little slow. slow. But I'm just saying, the right is winning these fights, right? They're winning. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes Governor Abbott sending the busloads up to New York and Chicago and California. Yes. Like, they, these people have to feel the actual effects of their policies, and then slowly but surely, they start to see reason on the gender stuff. 70% of the American population believes that boys should not be playing in girls' sports, no matter what they declare themselves. That's something on which there's common ground. DEI, as I said before, that people are starting to shift on that and see the folly of this dividing us by race. And even those who aren't seeing it are going to have to live with it because we have a great U.S. Supreme Court right now that is issuing ruling after ruling, setting things straight, right? From Dobbs to the affirmative action case, and we're going to get a whole lot more like it. So that's not to say that they haven't crossed a lot of disturbing norms with the lawfare and so on. But I do think regular Americans aren't as divided and are starting to see the wisdom in a lot of these fights the right has been fighting for a long, long time. Let's fight. Let's win. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Kelly. Thank you.